الله رب العالمين بارع الخلاق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وخاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان للمشركين أن يعمروا مساجد أي يأمر مساجد الله شهدين على أنفسهم بالكفر أولا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد These two verses from Surah At-Tawbah verses number 17 and 18 discuss 
several points that inshallah will come across about the building of mosques first of all what is the meaning of the building here that's one question that the interpreters of the Quran asked the second thing is what does Allah refer to in the terms of masajid the mosques all mosques certain mosques that's another question then the third is who can build and who cannot build who's capable of building according to these two verses and who's incapable of building these are a few questions inshallah we'll go over first of all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ma kana lil an masajid Allah. the mushrikeen those who associate someone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they would not be the one who would build the mosques of Allah masajid of Allah masajid Allah so then what does Allah here mean by ya'muru ya'mur of course come from the word ammara which means to build to build something and hence a building in Arabic is called imara a building when you fix something when you perfect something that is also considered building and hence age age in Arabic is umr umr the age why because you're building yourself throughout time you know your soul is getting developed your mind and body is getting developed and as you said bismillah rahman rahim as you heard in the ayah just now recited in surah yasin woman nu'ammirhu nunakishu fil khalq woman nu'ammirhu what does nu'ammir mean allah says whomever we prolong his life we will weaken him that's the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once you live longer you become weaker and hence Imam al-Baqir says a group of people came to their prophet a nation came to their prophet and they said ya Rasulallah pray to Allah that he does not make us die so he said okay now they were not smart enough you know they just asked for them not to be not to die so he said okay ya Allah anhum al -maut. don't make them die and Allah said okay we'll accept your dua so then they started growing older older and weaker that's one thing they didn't think about they asked when they're young and strong all of a sudden now they're much older weaker they are incapable of moving and then the parents grew but they became grandparents great-grandparents so now the children have to take care of all those generations so finally they came to their prophet and they said ya rasulallah pray to allah to bring death back to us we don't want to stay alive like this so he prayed for them and indeed Allah accepted his dua again so there is a wisdom sometimes in death no Allah says so whomever we prolong his life this umur why because you're getting developed just like a building when it gets developed and hence the same word so Allah says that this building they would not be the one building now here the Mufassirin, some say building means literally. Literally, they would not be the ones building. Of course, those Mushrikeen, especially the Mushrikeen who were fighting against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would not be the one building the Masajid. They are fighting against the Masajid. They are fighting against Islam. They are engaging in combat. So they would not be the ones who are building. They would not build. Others said, not necessarily just the building itself. It could also mean the spiritual building. They would not be the ones who would physically come into the masajid and build the masajid. In that sense, spiritually build the masajid. 
Alama Tabatabai, may Allah bless his soul, he goes more towards the first meaning. He says that the building is no physical building. They would not be the ones who would physically build. Ayatollah Sheikh Nasr Makaram Shirazi, he says both meaning could be possible. They could also refer to the physical building and could also refer to the spiritual building. He accepts both. Then, Allah says, مَا كَانَ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ أَنْ يَعْمُرُوا مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ Okay, now the question is, what masajid here are they talking about? Or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to? Some say he is referring to Masjid al-Haram. Why? Because later on, later on, after these two verses, Allah says, أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ so here Allah refers to Masjid al-Haram and hence they say that he is referring to Masjid al-Haram. These masajid refer to Masjid al-Haram. And because Masjid al-Haram is also a masjid and it has the sanctity of other masajid as well, hence Allah refers to it as masajid. But he refers to Masjid al-Haram. And Allama Tabatabai goes to this meaning. He likes this meaning. That it is Masjid al-Haram. In other words, the mushrikeen would not be the ones building Masjid al-Haram. If it gets destroyed, they don't care about it. They would not be the ones building it. They would not be the ones taking care of it. And he, the reason he says this meaning is the one that he thinks it is, because he says when we do Umrah, Ya'muru here, he's, it also could mean Umrah. When you do Umrah, you only do Umrah to which mosque? Masjid al-Haram. And hence, مَا كَانَ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ أَنْ يَعْمُرُوا مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ Mushrikeen will not go for Umrah. And therefore he concludes that this mosque is most probably referring to Masjid al-Haram. Ayatullah Shaykh Nasr Makarim Shirazi says not necessarily. It could mean not just Masjid al-Haram, other masajid. Because if we take the meaning of the spiritual building, Mushrikeen would not spiritually come and build the mosque spiritually. And hence it could apply to any mosque. So we have differences of opinions among the interpreters of the Quran. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the justification why those mushrikeen would not be the ones who could be building. Shahidina ala anfusihim bil kufr. They would testify upon themselves with kufr wal billah, rejection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How would they testify upon themselves? Either verbally, like Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, when he was killed in the Battle of Badr. When he was killed, he shouted, Billati wal Uzza. I swear by Lat and Uzza, the two main idols of Quraysh. So the Prophet wasallam said, This man is even worse than Fir'aun. At least Fir'aun, when he was drowning, what did he say? Qala amantu bi Rabbi Haruna wa Musa. Now I have, you know, I believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. I have become a believer now. At the end of his life, you know. This man, even when he was dying, he says, I swear by the Lat and the Uzza. So they are just such individuals. Unfortunately, when the truth is clear, like the sun, not tonight, but usual, like the sun in the skies, even when it's so clear, they would not accept it. They would not accept the truth. And that's how we have the reality in these days about Islam and about Ahlul Bayt The truth is so clear to anyone who has a mind, the aql, who thinks a little bit. That's why when people reflect a little bit, they come to the conclusion that Islam is the haq, is the truth. Ahlul Bayt are the haq, the truth. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. A person needs just to think. One of the ulama, he told me once, he said, I went to Indonesia. He says, in a village in Indonesia. In that village in Indonesia, where everybody was not a follower of Ahlul Bayt, I saw one man who came to me, approached me. He said, are you a Shia imam? He said, yes. You know, he saw my turban, my abaya, my clothing. I told him, yes. He said, I am a Shia too. So I asked him, I said, how did you become a Shia? You're in a village where there are no other Shia, no other followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam He said, a few years ago I went to Hajj. 
in Hajj, those of you who were in Hajj in the 80s, you know, they did not have the facilities that they do have these days, especially in Arafat. If you go to Arafat, Arafat was a desert. Well, until now it's a desert, but at least now they have the facilities. You don't feel it anymore. But back then, there, were no facilities. there was no water. So you have really to take care of the water. Water was an issue. So he said, we were in Arafat. There was no water. It's a desert, hot. The time of Salat came. So I was searching around to find some water. Now it's a desert. Water is scarce. And the wudu, of course, of our brothers is to wash the feet. Washing the feet. So they need more water to do so. He said, as I was searching for water, I saw a man who was doing wudu. <laughs> with one half of the class and the other half he drank. It's true. I mean, a glass of water would be suffice, you know, sufficient enough to do wudu. And you can still have, mashallah, conserve the environment, you know, and drink, quench your thirst. He said, when I saw this, I was surprised. So I approached this man. I told him, what kind of wudu have you done? You know, remember, this is not at the time yeah, alhamdulillah, good. Some people are very good. They understand. So, some, he said, this was not the age of the internet, you know, where people can go on the internet, satellite. No, this is, we're talking back in the 80s. So this man had not heard about another madhab, you know, something new, foreign. So he said, he approached him, I approached this man, and I told him, what is this wudu you have done? I've never seen a wudu like this before. He told him, well, I'm a follower of the Ja'fari Madhab, Shia. He said, what is this Madhab? I haven't heard of it before. So he explained to me a little bit. And then he told me, this is the wudu we do. We wash the face, we wash the arms, but then we wipe the head and we wipe the feet. As per to the Quran and as per the Actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's the wudu of the Prophet. And that's the wudu that was taught to us also by our Imams alayhi wa sallam. He said, it really struck me at that moment. He said, that moment struck me. I said to myself, if this is the way wudu is done in this madhab, this has to be the right madhab. Because when it's a desert and there's not much water, this is a good way of performing wudu. So he said, I decided to go back. When I went back, when I came back here to Indonesia, I did some research and I found this is the haqq. So I became a follower of Ahlul Bayt. It just takes a little bit of brains, aql, mind. All he had is to see a man doing wudu in front of him. That's it. When a person has the mind, the aql keeps the bias away. The, the clear, you know, the, the, the truth is clear very clear maybe there are some clouds that come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test us he sometimes puts the clouds but the sun is clear you can tell when it's day and when it's night so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those mushrikeen they would not be capable of building a masjid why because they physically reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by their actions either verbally they reject Allah or by their actions they come and for example worship the idols Oh, nowadays, we have many idols. Wealth has become an idol in this day and age. Money has become an idol in this day and age. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this. On the day of judgment, he says, when these idols that they have taken will be brought forth and they will be asked, do intercession for them, but they are incapable of doing intercession to them. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the intercession. And of course, Allah gives permission to those who, whom he wishes to give intercession as well. So, they don't build the masajid because they testify, because of their actions against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those individuals, the mushrikeen, all their actions have gone in vanity. And they will end up in the hellfire. All their actions are invalid, void. Why? Because 
the action, the main thing for the action to be accepted is what? To have the niya for who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the hadith says, niyatul mar ablagu min amalih. The intention of, a, of the person is more important than his own actions, his intentions. I intend to coming to mosque tonight. I truly intend to. I prepare myself, I get myself ready, I dress up, I sit in my car, I drive. But then, for example, I get a flat tire, which delays me. So by the time I fix it, I do all that stuff, I miss mosque. Well, my intention was to come. I put in the effort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards me for this action. Out of his rahmah, his mercy. He gives me the credit for it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges us best based on our actions. Now a person will ask me, he says, okay, what about those individuals who do good actions, good deeds? The philanthropists. There are some philanthropists in the world who will build hospitals. They might build schools. If you go to the certain universities, you'll say some buildings. And you'll see so-and-so. This building was donated by so-and-so. This action was done by so-and-so. So what about those people? Don't they get rewarded? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Quran in Surah Al-Rahman, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ That's a universal law. Isn't the reward for kindness but kindness? In other words, when you do kindness, Allah will reward you with kindness. But there's a difference here. If a person does kindness not for the sake of Allah, then Allah will reward them with kindness in dunya. Yes, he'll get this building with his name on the building. Newspapers and media outlets will publish his name. People will say, great, he was a big scholar, big thinker, big whatever. Civil rights individual. That's what the reward will be in dunya. In dunya. But if a person does it fi sabilillah, Allah will reward him in dunya and in the akhirah. The ihsan will apply to him in dunya and in the akhirah. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, he gave. Allahumma salli ala. He gave, he gave fi sabilillah. Everything he had, he gave fi sabilillah. And hence, when people remember Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, nowadays, what do they say? Salamullah alayhi. Even if they don't say salamullah alayhi, they say, karram Allahu wajha. May Allah bless his face. Because he never did sujood to a sanam. That's how they remember. Whenever they think of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, they think of goodness, kindness, justice. Even the Christians, as I mentioned, George Judak as a Christian Lebanese writer, he says, Ali, the voice of a human justice. He's written a book. Ali, the voice of a human justice, a Christian man. So that's when they think of Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi This is his reward in dunya. And in akhirah, well, of course, it's needless to say. The minute Abdul Rahman ibn Mujim hit him, he said, Fustu wa rabbil Ka'bah. I have won by the Lord of the Kaaba. Indeed, in the akhirah, he's got the highest status with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, when people do good in this dunya, if it's not fi sabilillah, Allah will reward them with goodness. But in this dunya, that's when they get their rewards. In the akhirah, Allah will hold them responsible. And hence, Allah says about the mushrikeen or the kuffar, they cannot build the masajid because all their actions have no intention. They have no meaning, no value. If they don't intend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. khalidun. Since their actions are not fi sabilillah, then they'll end up into the hellfire. So who builds the masajid? Innama ya'muru masajid, Allah, Allah says. Innama adatu hasr means only. Only those individuals. Who are they? These individuals build the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now as I mentioned, this building could be physically built, as Allah Tabatabai mentions, or could mean spiritual building. Spiritually built. Because the masajid, not only, you know, they are get built, the masajid are institutions that build as well. When individuals come to the centers, they build themselves, they develop themselves. And hence, I always tell mu'mineen and mu'minat, wherever I go, brothers and sisters, one way to raise good children, mu'mineen, in this part of the world and any part of the world, is to continue bringing them to such majalis. When the children are brought to these majalis from a young age, they, it becomes part of them. Even little children. One day, I gave a lecture someplace. A lady sent me an email, a mu'mina. She said, I have a son who is three years old. Three years old. I bring him to the majlis and he, I bring him some toys to keep him busy. 
He plays with his toys during the majlis. She said, all of a sudden, I realized when we go back home, he appeared to be playing with his toys, but his ears was actually listening. Because when he goes back home, I hear him saying some of the words you were speaking on the member. Three-year-old, you think he's playing. He's not paying attention. But they listen. And this plays a role in their lives from that young age. Then they grow, they develop, they remember these words. That's how it keeps their integrity, their religious sanctity. Their religious identity is kept this way. It's brought up. But some people, sometimes they call me, they say, for example, come and help my son or my daughter. He is 17, she is 18. And they don't want to come to, come to mosque anymore. They don't want to pray anymore. I tell them, well, did you bring them to mosque when they were little? They say, no. I tell them, this is very important. So these institutions, not only are they built, they build themselves. They build. They build pious individuals, mu'mineen, muttaqeen, good people. Because if you think about it, the minute you come through these doors, you listen to verses of Quran being recited. You listen to dua. You listen to a lecture. You pray salah jama'ah. I mean, everywhere you turn in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you get thawab. You know, sometimes when you go on a boat in the middle of a lake, everywhere you turn, you can get water. This is the same thing. Everywhere, whatever action you do, if you serve in the, in the Husayniya or in the mosque, you get thawab for. If you serve tea, you get thawab for doing so. If you clean it, you get thawab for cleaning it. We have a hadith about this. Cleaning the masjid. How important it is. And so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ Allah." Physically, those who build the masajid, the physical masajid, are who? Now, Sheikh Nasir Makarim Shirazi, he says the building not just means physical building, but even the spiritual building. Why? He says because we see, especially in this day and age, even in the early days of Islam, when the so-called Khalifas came to power, they would build masajid. Al-Walid Abd ibn Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan, he built the Umayyad Masjid in Damascus. Masjid al-Aqsa, it was built. Sorry, the Masjid al-Sakhra was built by... Uh, some individuals, some khulafa. Recently, recently, not, I mean, recently, I mean, the past 20 years or so, I have a friend, a mu'min, one of the ulama, he went to a city in some country where they've built a state of the art masjid. State of the art masjid. Very nice. He said, I came to pray. I saw a man, old man, he came to me and he said, Don't pray in this masjid. I told him, Why not? He said, because this land is ghasb, maghsuba. This land is, is not just. They force people out of their homes to build this masjid. And you know, one of the laws that when you pray in a land, it cannot be against the will of the owner of the land. You cannot, I cannot go occupy somebody's house and go pray in that house. It doesn't work, ghasb. So he said, this, this land is ghasb, maghsuba. The king just wanted to, you know, show off that he can build such a beautiful monument and hence he built this masjid. It was built not for the sake of Allah, for his sake. So, hence, Ayatollah Sheikh Nasser Makam Shirazi says that this could refer to, not physically, the physical building, but also can refer to the institutional building, you know, the spiritual building. So who builds the masajid? Man amana billahi wal yawmil akhir. There are two criteria. Allah mentions five criteria. First, Iman in Allah. You have to have the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The belief in Allah. The belief in Allah alone is not good enough. Because even the mushrikeen of Mecca, they believed in Allah. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ قُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah did. They don't reject Allah. They believe in Allah. They associate with Allah. They thought that their idols bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they also believe in Allah. So Allah here says that 
Indeed, the ones who build the masajid are those who believe in Allah, but not only believe in Allah, وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ And also believe in the hereafter. One day we will be held accountable for our actions. Are we ready for that day? A mu'min has to sit down and think. One day Allah is going to ask me, Fulan, what have you done? Have you prepared for your akhirah? And that's why Imam Al-Sajjad Salamullah Alayhi and Ahlul Bayt tried to raise this awareness in our minds. In Dua Al-Hazin. In Dua Al-Hazin, which is recited after Salatul Layl. Imam Al-Sajjad Salamullah Alayhi says, Unaji ya Allah. He says, Do munajat. I do munajat. Unaji ya Allah. Until he says, وَكَيْفَ حِيلَتِي وَرَجَائِي إِذَا سَأَلْتَنِي غَدًا عَمَّا أَنْتَ أَعْلَمُ بِهِ مِنِّي فَإِنْ قُلْتُ نَعَمْ فَأَيْنَ الْمَهْرَبُ مِنْ عَدْلِكْ وَإِنْ قُلْتُ لَمْ أَفْعَلْ قُلْتَ أَلَمْ أَكُنْ الشَّاهِدَ عَلَيْكْ فَعَفْوَكَ عَفْوَكَ يَا مَوْلَاي قَبْلَ سَرَابِي لِلْقَطِرَانِ عَفْوَكَ عَفْوَكَ يَا مَوْلَاي قَبْلَ جَهَنَّمَ وَالنِّيرَانِ عفوك عفوك يا مولاي قبل أن تغل الأيدي للعناق. He says, what about me on that day when you have when you ask me about things that you are more aware of than me myself? If I say no, you would say you would reply back, I was the witness. How could you say no? That's why the hadith, the hadith says, be aware. Of what you do in your privacy when no one is watching because the one who is going to be the judge is the same one who will be the witness the judge who's gonna judge you he is the witness so you can't escape and hence the Imam says in this Dua al hazin that, Oh my Lord, what am I gonna say when you ask me about things that you are more aware of than myself if I say no, you will say, wasn't I the witness? And if I say yes, well, where am I going to go? Where am I going to turn to? If I confess, who shall I turn to except you? فَعَفْوَكَ عَفْوَكَ يَا مولاي. So have mercy upon me, Ya Allah. Forgive me. So this individual, when he realizes that there is one day when he will be held accountable, then he will start watching for what he does. And hence Allah says, مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَ الزَّكَاةِ establishes salat which means he works on his own perfection on his perfection and then after turning to fixing himself he turns to the society the mujtama the society he turns to them and tries to fix the problems in the society by giving the zakat helping the poor trying to alleviate the pain of individuals in the society being a good citizen to the world من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة ولم يخشى إلا الله and he does not fear anyone but Allah سبحانه وتعالى this is fear the fear of عبادة the fear of عبادة there are individuals of course who fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى because he is worthy of being afraid who worship Allah because he is worthy of being worshipped, like Amir al-Mu'mini, who says, my Lord, I did not worship you because I am seeking your Jannah, nor am I worshipping you because I'm afraid of your Jahannam, your hellfire, your punishment. I'm worshipping you because I saw you that you are worthy of being worshipped. That is the status of Amir al-Mu'mini, we don't reach that status. And Allah knows this. So Allah says, let's do business. Tijara, what is the business? You believe in me and my messenger, you worship me, you obey me, and I'll give you an exchange, what? Jannah, business. This is the business deal. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the fear that we will lose, we'll miss out of his reward, or we will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's also fine. Step by step until we can reach the level of Amir al-Mu'mini, salamullah alayhi, where we worship Allah for the sake of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, in other words, we have to ask ourselves. You know, we have to ask ourselves. If Allah does not give us Jannah, 
Allah doesn't. Will I still worship him? If Allah does not punish me in the hellfire, would I still not disobey him? That's a question that we have to ask ourselves, a genuine question. Amir al-Mu'mineen Allah says, yes, I would still worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he is worthy of being worshipped. Us, I don't know. In other words, if the government, you know, says you can drive any way you like, we would not give you a ticket. Would we still abide by the laws? Or would we just go drive any way we like? Now, so this is something we have to ask ourselves. And this is the khashya, this is the fear that Allah is talking about. Individuals who have these five characteristics. Iman in God, faith in Allah, believe in Allah. And the hereafter, which means they will be held accountable for their actions. Establish the salat and give the charity, the zakat, and have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his worship and his ibadah. So may those individuals be among those who are guided. May here is the prayer or the dua of those individuals, those five people. That, oh Allah, make us, may we become among those who are guided. This is the dua, our dua. Not that Allah is saying, maybe those individuals will, not, not Allah is saying, we. We would be saying, oh Allah. When we do all these actions, may we become among those who have been guided. And here is an interesting point that I will conclude with, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعَسَىٰ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنْ يَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُحْتَدِينَ Sometimes a person tries to give charity. Give charity. He tries to be generous. But in the heart, he is not really a generous person, but he tries. He tries. Whenever an opportunity comes, he starts giving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam say that no, there are certain individuals who sh when they become generous, they should become generous from the heart. From the heart. How? You have to train yourself. Train yourself slowly to give. Give. Give until it becomes a habit, a habit that you just give without even thinking, such that it becomes your inner soul, it becomes your inner action. That is a difference between one who is generous and between one who is from within. His soul is generous. How does that get achieved? From constant doing, constant giving. There are people who control their temper, control their temper. Once, twice, three times, until finally it becomes something that's from within them. They don't have to put an effort in controlling their temper. That is something good. This is hidayah. This is the true meaning of hidayah. So you see the difference? There are individuals who put in the effort to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to perfect their manners and their akhlaq. But when they continue, 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 such that it becomes part of themselves, then this is the higher level of akhlaq and ibadah, the worship. That's what we have to work in our lives towards achieving. That if somebody hurts me, I will not bother, it's okay. Once, twice, three times, ten times, a hundred times until it becomes a habit. When somebody says something to me, tries to upset me and anger me, no, I can control myself. I don't have to even put an effort in controlling myself. This is the greatest status of ibadah. This is the ibadah of Ahlul Bayt, sallamullahi alayhi majma'een. And hence you would find them giving when they had no money. They would give. Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallamullahi alayhi, many times would give when he had no money, no money, he would give. That's true generosity. They would control themselves and never get angry, except for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pleasure of Allah. So that's what we have to pray towards achieving, inshallah. Mu'mineen and mu'minat, let us try to build masajid, places of worship, 
physically and spiritually because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember the mu'mineen who build institutions for him for his sake man bana masjidan lillah bana Allah lahu daran fil jannah whomever builds a masjid for Allah Allah will build him a place in jannah whomever brings light nur into a mosque or a prayer of worship to Allah Allah will enlighten his book of rewards for as long as this light is on all this is the reward so let us put in the effort of building building institutions building the community building the society such that inshallah we among become among those who fear Allah and would be guided inshallah through the light of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our lives in dunya and in the akhirah we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all our sins and to fulfill our hajat inshallah laylatul jumu'ah let's raise our hand for dua a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim amma yujibu al-mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-su' amma yujibu al-mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-su' أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء اللهم اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله كفر عنا سيئاتنا يا الله وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله مع محمد وآله الأطهار يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المحتاجين يا الله شافي وعافي جميع المرضى يا الله على الخصوص من أوصانا بالدعاء منهم اللهم ألبسهم لباس العافية واقض حوائجهم جميعا يا الله اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ارحمنا برحمتك الواسع يا أرحم الراحمين ارزقنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات